Um, and then also, and then also, oh, that's the microphone. Um, and then also joining us online. Um, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment um, to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on, of the land on which we, of the unceded land on which we work, learn, and gather today. The Wurundjeri Wurrung people and the Wurrung peoples. The university also acknowledges and is grateful to the traditional owners, elders, and knowledge holders of all Indigenous nations and clans who have been instrumental in our reconciliation journey. We recognise the unique place held by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the original owners and custodians of the lands and waterways across the Australian continent, with histories of continuous connection dating back more than 60,000 years. We also acknowledge the enduring cultural practices of caring for country. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledge in the academy. As a community of researchers, teachers and professional staff and students, we are privileged to work and learn every day with our Indigenous colleagues and partners. So I'm delighted to be here tonight for this very special event, which is answering the question, or maybe not answering, definitely exploring the question, um, whether or not sustainable finance will save the planet. So joining us here tonight, we're very fortunate to have three um, eminent speakers. So first of all, I'll introduce Professor Brendan Wintle. Professor Brendan Wintle is the Director of the Melbourne Biodiversity Institute and Professor in Biodiversity Conservation here at the University of Melbourne. He develops economic methods to support conservation decisions and policy and has been the Director of Australia's Threatened Species Recovery Research Hub um, the UN IPBES co coordinating order. Welcome, Brendan. <laughs> Next, I'm delighted to have joining us Dr. Arjuna Dibley. Arj is the head of the Sustainable Finance Hub, part of Melbourne Climate Futures at the University of Melbourne. He joined the university after a decade of experience working on climate change and sustainable finance globally as a financial sector advisor, commercial lawyer, and senior policy analyst, and was recently awarded the Paul Burke Award for Early Career Research by the Academy of Social Science in Australia. So congratulations and welcome, Arj. <laughs> and finally, we're also delighted to have joining us here tonight, Dr. Jodie York. Jodie is the Chief Impact Officer for Kalara Capital, a Melbourne-based impact investment manager focusing on decarbonisation. She's an impact strategist and academic uh, with a deep interest in shared frameworks for non-financial disclosures that are balanced, credible and comparable. So thank you and welcome, Jodie. <laughs> so before we begin our discussion, just a few couple of housekeeping items. Um, we would love to hear from you and we'll have some time for questions at the end of tonight. Um, and for those joining us online, please feel free to uh, send through your questions in the Q&A um, and our team will collect those behind the scenes. Um, so perhaps as sort of a bit of an introduction um, to our topic tonight to make this a bit more digestible and break down. Um, I was wondering if each of us, you could tell us about your background and how your work intersects with this topic of sustainable finance. So we might start with Arj. Uh, all right. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Beck. Very happy to. Um, I have a couple of slides, but um, I, I promise to keep it very short. Um, so, as Beck mentioned, um, leading an initiative at the uh, at the University on Sustainable Finance, um, and really trying to do applied research that might help um, uh, advance this kind of nascent um, but emerging field, um, and in particular to address what, it, what you'll see through these slides as, as a very substantial financing gap uh, to address our sustainability crises that we're currently facing. Uh, so I, as Beck mentioned, I'll, I'll just make a couple of introductory remarks because um, sustainable finance, I think, um, can, uh, can confuse people and it is an emerging area. So, um, so if we go to the first slide, um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the first point to make is um, why, why are we talking about sustainable finance at all? Um, uh, and, and really, the primary reason is um, because 
um, from a climate change perspective, and, and Brendan will probably tell us more um, about the, the biodiversity crisis, but from a climate change perspective, um, we are still in a world where global greenhouse gas emissions are, are increasing. Um, and so if you focus your attention on the, on the graph at the, at the top there, you'll see the, um, the rates of growth of, 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 of emissions um, and some projections of, of where we might be headed. Um, uh, the, the top line um, basically shows the, the current policy settings of, of countries if they introduced their, uh, their if, they, if they maintain their current policy settings. And that shows that we're headed towards a, a three degree world, so three degrees above um, pre-industrial average temperatures. And what does that mean? Well, um, you know, scientists try to estimate this in, in real world uh, language, but um, and we could pick a bunch of different metrics, but um, but on average, in a three degree world, um, uh, the 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 um, the incidence of of um, uh, of major heat wave events will increase from five percent to eighty um, percent in in any given year. So you can think about how that might play out um, across the whole global economy, um, and um, so so. You know, we're heading in the wrong direction, I think is the main point. Um, why, why are we heading in the wrong direction? Uh, well, you know, from, a, from an economist's point of view, um, the, the main reason is that our economy currently doesn't uh, take account of um, environmental damages uh, in, in, in the way that it operates. So these are all pushed outside the realm of our everyday transactions. So we don't properly price um, uh, environmental costs, so carbon pollution uh, isn't costed into our everyday transactions, um, what economists like to call externalities. Um, and, and, you know, changing that system is, is really complicated. Um, and you know you're in a lot of trouble when you've got people like Mark Carney, who, who's pictured here, he's the former um, Bank of England um, governor uh, and former investment banker. You know, when when, when central bankers start using the words revolution, that a revolution is required to increase uh, the, the amount of capital and to change the economic system, you know you're in a lot of trouble. So if we go to the next slide, um, this, this is the financing gap that I mentioned before. Um, uh, this figure basically steps out um, uh, the, the, the current level of financing that's going towards activities that um, support um, Re reducing emissions or, or responding to climate change. Uh, and you'll see that the number is around $1.3 trillion uh, annually. Um, and on, on the other side, um, you'll see where we, where we should be, which is somewhere around uh, eight or $9 trillion um, annually and, and increasing over time. So there's a, there's a very substantial gap indeed. Um, so if we go to the next slide, you know, I think there was, uh, there was, I think when we started on this track, um, economists really hoped that we would be able to introduce this very elegant policy mechanism uh, called carbon pricing. Um, we, we've heard it in the public debate here as carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes. Um, and that would have you know, internalized all of these costs in the economy and it would have helped reduce um, the amount of funding that we needed to, to address these, these environmental crises. But, as we learned in Australia, the politics of carbon pricing has been pretty challenging. And so where does this leave us? It, it leaves us in a sort of second best world where we have these unpriced environmental risks um, and they're starting to materialize and they're starting to affect the economy in, in a real way. Um, and if we go to the next slide, it, it leads us to a place where we, we're trying to now price in these environmental costs through um, other mechanisms, including the financial system. So sustainable finance is really about trying to integrate some of these unpriced environmental externalities into, into the financial system. And, and to do that requires a lot of regulation. So this figure shows the growth in regulation um, since the 2000s. Um, and you can see we're, we're on a pretty steep growth curve. And so I think some of our other panelists will talk to us a bit more about what those, what those um, standards and, and, and regulatory mechanisms look like and what they're trying to do. So I'll stop there. Yeah, that was a really great and helpful introduction. I did a really nice segue, I think, to Jody, who's going to be starting to tell us a little bit more about what some of these tools are that have been emerging. Um, would you be able to take it over, please, Jody? Thank you, Beck. 
Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of uh, tools that are being developed um, to make it, because clearly that, that financing gap, you know, you don't even have to look at the scale to know that that was very large. <laughs> um, and one of the obstacles in directing capital to things is concern about whether it's actually going to make a difference, whether you can trust the information, um, whether you know, someone says, this is green, all right, great, put my money in there, and then you see information in the news about companies being delisted, and uh, there was a bunch of this in, in Europe last year. Um, and what's happening in response to this uh, is a sustainable finance taxonomy. Um, and the diagram there is to show you that, you know, it's all right, everybody's gonna have one. <laughs> uh, and what that does is a taxonomy, just like we use a taxonomy for, for biological things, like you know, either it's a, it's a marigold or a dandelion, but it can't be both. So it, it categorizes things into, into hierarchies and boxes. Um, and what it does for companies is it helps them understand whether or not their, their activities fit in one of those boxes. What it helps for investors is direct capital to credibly to things that are in those boxes. And one of the things that is um, really happening is <clears throat> it's also being used as an enforcement tool. Because now we've had a bunch of experts put together a list of what, is, what actually counts. And if it's not on that and you're talking about it as green, they're now going after you for greenwashing. So the regulators globally are starting to use this as a tool to bring people into line about what you can and can't claim, um, to just improve the integrity of the signal out there in the market about what counts. You know, should I should I trust you? Is it all is it all lies? Which is something that some people out there in the market believe. Um, oh, it's all it's all just hogwash. Um, next slide, please. Now. One of the other things that I'm excited about, and don't worry too much about the fact that there's a lot of things on that slide, uh, is the International Sustainability, Sustainability Standards Board um, has issued uh, new standards for um, sustainability and climate-related disclosures. The focus on this, if you've heard of them at all, people focus on the disclosure. Oh, businesses have to do this, and they have to do this. Um, and what, what it is, is there's been this absolute patchwork of frameworks, and this is a convergence so that we can all use one, and we're working from the same dictionary because we will have taxonomies that interact with each other, um, and we can use one form of reporting in which people have to report the same sort of information on the same terms, you know, so you've got a data definition, it's not what your opinion of, of your greenhouse gas emissions is, it's the definition of scope one emissions. Um, and it also integrates various aspects of sustainability and uh, climate and how those interact with your business in a, uh, in a way that is financially material. Does it affect, do these things affect your business prospects? But the thing that's really exciting about it to me, if we go to the next slide, is actually its value as a management tool it's built on, so some of those uh, logos you may have seen on there earlier. Um, <clears throat> so the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, uh, put a lot of effort into making a very good framework. Um, and in fact, it's so good that we decided to use it over here as well uh, and in a variety of other places. So we start to have a sense of frameworks all kind of look alike and this is what's going to be, what, what sorts of categories are going to be in them. So what happens here is the, the four blue boxes in the middle, these are the boxes that you do have to disclose on, so you have to report back to the market, back to investors as well, on governance, uh, risk management, strategy, uh, and what kind of metrics you're using. But this isn't a down at the end of the line reporting exercise. It's questions like, what are the physical risks that are going to affect your business with, with climate change or with changes in regulations? What are the opportunities that will emerge? What about this transition? What if things in your supply chain are no longer going to be able to operate? So it's forcing you to think about the entire value chain 
and, see, and take a position in public on what you think that's going to mean and how, you know, it's open there for the market to see how credible it is. And the goal there is for investors and other users of financial information to be able to make an apples for apples assessment of between companies uh, in most places in the world that are using the same standards. Uh, now, that's fine. So the, the, uh, the ISSB standards were the red box off to the side over here. Uh, so it just fits into a nice, into a nice frame that where the already exists, already builds on reporting the businesses are going to do, and that investors are already becoming more familiar with looking at. Um, can we go to the previous slide? I just want to talk for a minute about the difference between, I work in impact investing, and I want to talk for a minute about the difference between ESG investing and impact investing, because they're, they're often sort of conflated in the media. Um, and we can think about investment as a, as a continuum. And down at, down at the far end over here, we're looking at, I like to think of it as impact agnostic. Is it hurting people or planet? I don't know. That wasn't important information, and it's not material for our decision making. Uh, and that space is starting to, starting to become harder to operate there, because you've got more stakeholders demanding a bit more. Um, then you can look at ESG as a source of how we identify risks. So ESG stands for environmental, social, and governance. You know, if you have slavery in your supply chain, that's a social risk. Uh, if you have corruption, that's a governance risk. But ESG can also be used to identify opportunities, right? So who are the better performers in these things? Let's move capital to them, which is kind of the next box over as we work our way up the, con up the continuum. Now, impact investing is there with the dark boxes over the top, um, which is the ESG is retrospective. So did bad things happen? And did we respond to them? Um, impact investing is prospective, right? What are we actually trying to change? And how will we know whether we're delivering on that? Um, and there's a couple of things toward the end there, including evidence-based philanthropy, because there's lots of desire to make change and use evidence to make change. Not all of it is, is investment. I work in you know, market rate investing. Uh, it's private equity. Um, makes the sort, same sorts of returns that people expect from private equity. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, this is what we're trying to do in the world. So if you look at where emissions are coming from, you know, if you wrap it up across all sectors, it should be kind of self-evident, but the, uh, the number one problem, the number one activity, is burning fossil fuels to do stuff, whether that means burning them and turning them into electricity, when we burn coal for electricity, for instance, whether it means burning them in our vehicles, in transportation, whether it means you know, setting them on fire and using them to use the, the heat for processes in industry. You know, so all of those, we need to find a way to get away from. Um, and in addition, you have to look at where else, if you take a systems view, what are the drivers of that? And one of the key, one of the key drivers is the resource footprint, the, the material footprint of the things that we buy and sell and consume. So um, all of that is embodied energy, anything that's kind of had a lot of transformation. If you think about, you know, you grow, you grow uh, wheat, and then you transform it into flour, and then you make it into bread, and then you take it to the bakery, and then you put it in a distributor and it goes to Woolies. That's a really simple one. You know, what about an iPhone? Think about how many things go into an iPhone and how they had to be moved around and dug out of the ground and transformed from one form to another. So all of that material footprint, that natural resource footprint, drives carbon emissions. So we also invest in things which reduce those through uh, things like circular economy. Um, but it also means we've got to change the system, how it works. Right, so what are, what are production norms? What do people think is okay to, to, to do in a business uh, because everybody else is doing it? And shifting markets, what do we think is okay to consume? Do we have, do we have the options that actually align with what we want to do in the world? Um, 
And so sometimes that's about you know, growing, growing new alternatives, more sustainable alternatives. Sometimes it's about looking at the change that's going to be required to move some of the big problems. Say, well, they're going to need a supply chain of bioplastic resin, for instance. So we better get on finding out who's doing that and how well that's coming along. Because you're not going to be able to meet those challenges when you get there if you don't have the supply chain for it. I will stop there. Uh, because I don't Perfect. want to take a bother. No, thank you so much, both Arj and JD. So I think just to sort of summarise where we've got to thus far, so Arj, it was really great and helpful talking about, you know, the fact that we're headed for this three-degree world and we need to align finance with net zero, actually. And JD, you talked about some of the tools that are coming through to achieve that. So they're things like disclosure and taxonomies and impact investing. Both of those topics are sort of about the climate space Brendan, this might be a really good space for you to come in and tell us about, a bit about nature and biodiversity and actually why that's a bit different from climate as well and also why it's really important. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca, and uh, thanks very much for coming along tonight. Um, my name's Brendan. As Rebecca mentioned, I'm the director of Melbourne's new uh, Biodiversity Institute. I'm interested um, how many people came along this evening thinking that they were going to hear about climate and climate change and the risk that that poses to business and sustainable finance. Hands up. How many people thought they were going to be talking about biodiversity and nature and plants and animals? Thanks. <laughs> it, that's about, <clears throat> it's about what we get. Yeah. About a tenth. And so, you know, I, I would put it to you, and I'm sure you've heard it before, that biodiversity underpins all aspects of our life, our health, our well-being, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the air we breathe, the water we drink. Uh, we know that children that grow up in more biodiverse, natural environments in their schools have higher rates of cognitive development than children that grow, children that grow up in schools uh, that, are, that are homogenous and depauperate in terms of the environment and nature. We know that 70% of all medicines are either natural products or actually or, or copies of natural products. Uh, we know that um, the agricultural economy relies absolutely and completely on biodiversity. Pollinated crops make up 35% of world food production. Uh, the World Economic Forum estimates that, are, that more than 50% of global uh, GDP is directly dependent on nature. And so any significant changes and loss to nature, like the loss of pollinators, we've seen 75% decline in pollinators in Europe over the last 30 years. If that propagates out through uh, natural systems across the planet, we see dramatic changes in food systems, uh, potentially leading to famine and mass dislocation of peoples. Um, the Secretary General of the United Nations recently pointed out that uh, we absolutely cannot meet our goals for uh, limiting climate change if we don't meet our goals for nature, because nature underpins all of the uh, all of the biosphere that sequesters carbon into the oceans and uh, into into the ground via plants. So we currently sequester in, through natural systems around six gigatons of carbon a year and are emitting twelve. We have to grow as, as well as limiting our emissions. We have to grow the ability of nature to continue to sequester carbon if we're going to meet our goals for climate. So it's absolutely critical and yet we are seeing the greatest loss of biodiversity since the end of the dinosaurs. We, uh, the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is sort of like the, the uh, nature equivalent of the IPCC, tells us that we've got one million species at immediate risk of extinction and points to catastrophic changes to ecosystems across the planet. Here in Australia, we've lost 10% um, of the mammals that existed here when Europeans arrived. They no longer exist. Uh, and we're seeing a linear upward increase in the rate of extinction here in Australia. So uh, it's, it's the, the loss of biodiversity is, is palpable. We're seeing the decline in just the abundance of things. So anybody who's kind of my age or older, that is maybe born in the 70s or, or, or in the early 80s, has probably witnessed, and if they grow up in Australia, um, a dramatic decline in the existence of Christmas beetles or the moths that fly from the Alps to the tennis courts and, uh, every year. So, so these, uh, these changes are palpable and they're very real. And that's why we're seeing a very strong orientation towards trying to create um, 
a nature positive future and we now have a global biodiversity framework um, under the Convention on Biological Diversity that 188 nations signed up to at the end of 2022, that creates an imperative to actually conserve nature. We're going to ensure all of governments have agreed that we're going to secure 30% of all land, sea and fresh waters into conserving nature. Uh, we're going to curb extinctions, and this is a big ambition because of the rate of extinction is very, very strong, so that needs to be curbed. And really importantly, um, nations undertook to compel large corporations to disclose their nature risks, that is how nature, nature loss impacts on their businesses, but also how they are impacting on nature and what risks that might create for them in terms of reputation and uh, transition risk and um, regulatory risk. So there's, a, so there's a, a growing awareness, I guess, and we're now seeing uh, the TCFD mirrored into something that I'm sure many of you have heard of, the TNFD, which is the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, that is starting to push down the line and we're seeing that requirement coming to businesses. Uh, and I am getting so many telephone calls from superannuation firms, from banks, and very many organisations and big businesses that are now realising that they're going to have to report on biodiversity nature. What the hell is that? Uh, you know, that's a really tricky question for a lot of people. Most of these immense organisations have one person who does ESG or a small team that does ESG and it's very likely that those, those people know a bit about social and a bit about uh, carbon and very, very little about biodiversity. So that's why I'm here because we're seeing that demand for a better understanding of what nature risk means and how we can try and transform businesses to try and deal with nature risk. Um, Becca asked me to comment on what's similar and what's different between nature and climate in terms of risk. The first thing and probably the, the most important thing is that nature is incredibly complex. We have over 8 million species, we think. We don't even know, of course. We've only described 1.7 million species. So science only knows of and has named 1.7 million species. So, you know, less than a quarter of the total number of species we think that exist. We conceptualise nature in many ways. We think about genes and genetic diversity. We think about species and species diversity. We think about ecosystems, which is the interaction before, between all of the living parts of the environment and the soil and the air and the water, the non-living parts of the environment. And we need to conserve ecosystems, obviously, in order to keep maintaining ecosystem services. And then we have biomes and higher um, uh, aggregations of nature. And so the measurement of all of these different components of nature, the understanding of it, trying to understand how the activities of the business, how investments might have a positive or negative impact on nature is very, very difficult. And the measurement process is very, very challenging. The other problem, or that the other, it's not a problem, the other reality about nature and biodiversity is that it's very value-laden, place-based and context-dependent. So a molecule of greenhouse gas here is the same as one over there, it's the same as one in China, it's the same as one in the United States. A koala in Victoria where koalas are very, very abundant, relatively speaking, is actually different to a koala in Queensland where they are listed as critically endangered and they're rapidly, rapidly declining. A slug is conceptualised quite differently to a koala. Um, and of course, there's also just a patch of vegetation in a suburb where it's the only patch of vegetation for kilometres around where it's the only place where children or, or people can interact with nature is actually has a different value to that same size patch in East Gippsland where there's quite a lot of that sort of, of, that sort of nature. So that place-based importance, that context dependence makes all of this understanding and reporting on your impacts that you might be having on nature or how changes in nature might impact on your business quite complex and difficult. And Maybe I'll leave it there because I'm sure we'll start to talk a little bit more about some of the details uh, and how that impacts on disclosures in it as we go. Yeah, and so I might we might have a couple of questions to all of you briefly and then we'll hand over to audience questions in maybe about 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I guess the question, there was a lot of, little bit of jargon used there talking about TCFD, TNFD, disclosure, taxonomies. I was wondering if each of, each of you could tell us a little bit about maybe particular 
particularly disclosure, this sort of framework that's coming through. Um, this is a way that we're seeing we're trying to get sustainable finance to be directed towards achieving greenhouse gas emissions reduction, so that's mitigation goals, and then also adaptation goals. That's how we adapt to the impacts of climate change and then also how it impacts on biodiversity. Mm. So maybe if you're all able to talk, reflect a little bit about what are the benefits of these sorts of disclosure tools that are coming through? And then also, what are the challenges with those sorts of tools as well? I might start with you, Arj. Yeah, sure, sure, Beck. Happy, happy to. Um, <clears throat> it is a... Um, appreciate that there's a lot of information that we've presented and yep. a lot of this sort of ties um, complex ideas about how the economy works with complex ideas about how ecosystems and the climatic system work. So there's multiple layers here. So let me um, try and simplify this in, in, by using a metaphor, which I, may be a slightly tortured metaphor. Um, so uh, bear with me for a minute. But uh, you know, when I sort of explain to students about how um, disclosure regimes work, I, I like to think of this analogy of you know, imagining yourself as an eight-year-old um, and you want to set up a lemonade stand, right? So um, the, currently our economy is structured and our, regu our financial system is structured in such a way that um, you're encouraged to get together with your friends, you know, share your complementary skills. Someone's got a great lemonade recipe. Someone's got a few dollars in a piggy bank. Um, so you go out, you, you share resources in a, in a company, a firm, your lemonade stall. Um, and, you know, maybe you break over the piggy bank, you buy some cups and you realise, oh, I need to buy more lemons. So you've got two options, really. One option is you can borrow some money from someone you trust, like your parents. So that's sort of the debt side of things. Um, or you can maybe knock on the door of your rich neighbours down the street and say, look, I'll give you a share in the, the profits of this um, lemonade stall if, if you give me some money. Um, and so we have this, um, you know, we've got this f f infrastructure that's kind of built around individuals coming together in firms. Um, and we have an economic system that sort of understands that the best way to get, you know, economic growth is through information about th those lemonade stands. Um, uh, and so the disclosure regimes and a lot of these regimes are really sitting on top of that. So they're, they're about giving information to the market, to the rich neighbours down the road and to your parents about, um, about how climate change or, or nature loss is going to affect your business. So for example, you know, um, at the moment, the, th the theory is that um, investors don't have a good sense of how extreme heat days are going to reduce the number of days you can sell lemonade out in the street, um, and that'll affect your profit margin. Or uh, they, they don't have good information about how pollinators might affect um, lemon growth, the, the kind of fundamental core ingredient to the product that you're selling. Um, uh, and so these disclosure regimes sit on top of that. And I think that certainly, you know, given the complexity that we've heard about, I think that's serving a really important function. I think there's a really big question about whether that's enough, um, given the nature of, um, you know, the scale of the biodiversity crisis that we've just heard from, from Brendan about, the, you know, the climate crisis. Is information provision, are these tools sufficient? Yeah. Um, and Jody, maybe you're able to tell us a little bit about, so that's more about the risk side of things, getting companies and financial sector entities to think about risk. Maybe you're able to tell us a little bit about taxonomies and how that sort of helps to steer green capital alignments, how we put money into green projects, for example, or adapting to climate change. Maybe you're able to tell us a little bit about that. Um, so one of the, I think, really interesting uh, differences uh, between the between nature and climate, uh, both of which are, are complex uh, topics, uh, well, complex systems, you know, we've, we've really, for better or worse, we've pushed very hard to get people to focus on emissions. This is the one number you need to know, right? This is, this is climate change right here. There's this one thing, scope one, scope two. It's actually complex, as I was talking about with, you know, the material footprints of goods, and there are all sorts of elements. And with nature, you can't roll down to just that one thing. Um, because it is context dependent, it is, it is specific. So one of the things that is sometimes uh, used in, um, in frameworks related to, to ESG and impact, if we think about nature, I'm gonna, because I don't know, I know less about bees, <laughs> but if we think about water, um, you know, there's a very different 
uh, it's a, puts in a different category whether you're using a bunch of fresh water in some place with abundant fresh water, like New Zealand, uh, or whether you're using fresh water in a place that doesn't have, that has strong water scarcity. Um, so one, one of which we monitor a little bit, one of which we monitor quite a bit differently. Um, so there is, there's a little bit of that, of, of that going on in the, uh, in the taxonomies, but a lot of it is, um, you see, you can have, you can have that, that box. It's sustainable if it is this category, and you can have sort of caveats on it. So long as it does, you know, a lot of the frameworks, um, it's not settled whether, I assume the Australian one will have it as well, but a lot of them are, do no significant harm. So they've got, they've got guardrails on them. Yes, you're in this box, but we're going to boot you out of this box and say it's not a sustainable activity if we can identify significant harm or you disclose significant harm. Um, and then also the, the social side. Yes, that's maybe the sustainable manufacturing, but it's not if you've got child, child labor in your supply chain. Um, things like that. So, so shaping not just the activity, but how the activity is done. Uh, and I think that's... And it's the requirement to, it's the requirement to disclose that drives the requirement to think about it. And that's actually, to me, the important part. Like investors, they get the disclosure. That's great. But for a business, it's the thinking about it. Because if you're sitting in the C-suite C -suite, and you've actually never considered how, you know, the, the uh, effluent from your farm is affecting the guy down the road's farm and his ability to engage in horticulture, for instance, because you're, you're polluting into his water supply, which means somebody upstream might be doing the same to yours. <laughs> um, so really fo focusing people to look at the interactions beyond the scope of their business, which is not something that uh, reporting and management norms have required them to do previously. You know, once you were at the boundary of your business, you were, that, that was it was somebody else's lemonade stand. Yeah, totally. So thinking about how your business is affected by all the little parts of your supply chain. Are you going to be able to get goods and services in a, in a warmed... Are you going to be able to acquire you know, all the components to make your products in a future um, that's warmed by climate change? Are you thinking about the long-term investment horizons as well with your products? Brendan, are you maybe able to tell us then a little bit... Come in here and tell us a bit about how these tools work kind of differently in the nature space? Yeah, I mean, look, the first thing I would say uh, is that in terms of, you know, stemming the extinction crisis and trying to, to um, turn things around for nature, these, pro these sustainable uh, finance, sustainable investment, um, disclosure tools, those sorts of things, they're one of the levers that we have. Uh, and I would say that they, are, that, that they can't solve the problem on their own. You know, we still need regulations, we still need actual active public investment in conservation. So it's not a silver bullet, it's not a panacea. However, uh, the new focus in the nature space and the still relatively new focus in the climate space on these um, mechanisms, I guess, to provide better information, better understanding for uh, shareholders and for consumers, uh, and ultimately, obviously, for investors, it's a very big step forward. It's a link that we had been missing before. So particularly in the nature space, uh, we really previously had hardly any mechanism for getting business and pri or private sector, significant business and private sector engagement and involvement in trying to prevent harm and trying to actually bring around better outcomes and, and, and restoration. So I would say, in the case of the, the disclosures around nature, the TNFD, uh, that's a huge step forward for us in it, mm -hmm. um, and just the existence of it. Of course, we actually have to operationalise it on the ground, and there's a lot of work to do because, um, as Jody said, I think the framework is good. Uh, they, it, it really makes sense. Uh, the whole locating your, your risks and then assessing and then, and then figuring out how you're going to act on those, it makes perfect sense. The challenge that we face is down at the nitty-gritty of the detail of what is it that we're going to measure when we're assessing the risk to our to a, What are we going to report? How are we going to make those decisions about 
um, our supply chain that we need to change or aspects of our on-ground operations that need to change, what sorts of variables are we going to think about there to help us make those decisions. Um, that stuff really needs to be worked through on the nature side. Um, I think it seems to be operating, <coughs> we'll talk about offsets in a minute, reasonably <laughs> well on the climate side already. But, um, but yeah, look, I see there's, there's a huge opportunity and something that we can't afford to waste. But of course, like all of these great opportunities, it comes with a really big risk, uh, particularly around greenwashing and a loss of faith and, and cynicism, I guess. So. Yeah. something to look out for. Brendan, that is a perfect segue into one final question before we turn over to the audience for questions. What is, and I'll ask this question to all our panellists, mm. what is the thing that keeps you up at night, Brendan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. That's, that's one of his questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, you know, obviously um, around this particular topic, it is the greenwashing. I, I just wonder, can we get the robustness around the measurement and the indicators of, of what risks businesses are bringing to nature and how they're dealing with them and, and, and how well they're reporting on that. Uh, that's a huge concern, obviously. And if we get that wrong, we're going to see businesses potentially operating in good faith, using tools that are, have been given to them by, you know, techie snake oil salesmen who claim, you know, if you use this tool, we can de-risk your uh, investments for nature and they use the tool and they might even sh shift their portfolio and lo and behold one of the companies in their portfolio drives a species to extinction and and they they, they hit up against a regulatory or reputational um, you know hurdle and so I think that really worries mm. me at the moment I feel like the promise is outstripping the knowledge and the um, and the the actual capability of tools at this stage. So we do have to be really careful. Mm. And Jody, how about you? What keeps you up at night? Time. Mm. We need to move like fire in a theater. Move. I don't know if I can say that in a theater, <laughs> but um, <laughs> we need to move. And even with COVID, we did. You know, miracles were worked science, policy, all sorts of things. We had an extreme example of everybody throwing in together, for the most part, to achieve a thing. And that barely put a dent in emissions. And then they bounded back with a vengeance. I'm concerned that by the time we rally and get far enough, none of it will make a difference. Mm. Mm. Now, so, I feel, now I feel like I've put a chill in the room. <laughs> but. And then to keep the lighthearted mover, <laughs> Arj, what keeps you well, up at night? Uh, I, I was telling some of, um, some of the panellists at um, the back, backstage that um, I, I rarely sleep at night anymore because I have an 18-month-old. So I'm, I'm rarely <laughs> asleep to be woken up from. But in those, in those few cases that I, I do get a good night's sleep, um, the thing that still keeps me awake is um, I, it's sort of <clears throat> similar to both of the points from, from Brendan and Jody, um, which is that, you know, I think we're building this fabulously complex system to get the financial system and for businesses to think about nature, think about these externalities. And I think we're, we're tracking really well on that. And despite complexities in, in, in implementation, um, what happens next is you know we have this theory that people, as I think Jody articulated really well, you know businesses will will start doing the analysis themselves, uh, and then they'll realise it's in their interests to move away from high polluting assets or from um, nature destroying assets. And what I'm worried about is that information might push people the other way, which is to say, and, and I think we're seeing this a little bit in um, you know, the, the energy sector at the moment where the pennies dropped that maybe there's a finite time frame for you know, the oil and gas industry, for example, to, to continue to operate. And, when you're armed with that information, you may not decide to get out of the business, but really suck everything you can out of <laughs> at your kind of incumbent position. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm worried that um, there may be a few of these kind of bumps along the road um, on, on the path to kind of fully realising what the sustainable finance system was set out to, to try to achieve. Yeah, so there's lots to be 
uh, to think about, lots to be concerned about, uh, but maybe, maybe we might be able to get some positive questions from the audience about what we maybe be positive about. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience. Um, we've got one over here at the moment, if the microphone is able to be brought down over here, and then we'll take some from online as well. Thank you for that. Um, in listening to the panel, I was, I was reminded of uh, Maynard Keynes, the famous economist, who said that there's a, a long run, there's a, there's a short run, and there's a long run. Uh, the difference is, in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> uh, what, can, uh, what can ordinary Australian investors mm. do to incentivise listed companies and financial institutions such as banks and super funds to accelerate their response to the impending climate change um, crisis in the context where the party best able to act, the federal government, is hopelessly conflicted, being in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry, is giving subsidies of something, something in, the, in the billions per year still to the fossil fuel companies and apparently impotent to act in imposing hard caps on I'm happy to start a response to that, but I imagine others will have yeah. comments too. Um, you know, I think, I think we, we ended on a pretty negative note, mm. so let me try and be a bit more upbeat, because I think, um, you know, we talk about these kind of very abstract large numbers um, uh, that are floating around in the financial system, but if you think about financial institutions, you mentioned super funds um, and banks, uh, really, these, these institutions are intermediaries for our money. Um, super funds are our retirement savings. Um, and so, you know, e each individual... It's easy, I think, in this conversation to feel very disempowered at an individual level, but, but actually, um, you know, those financial institutions exist to serve you and to manage your money. And um, so you're the customer, you're in the driver's seat in, in, in how you interact with these institutions. And so I think everyone has a really important role and some levers of influence um, if you have money in the financial system, which, which many of us in Australia do. Um, so I, I think absolutely you know, use those where you can because um, uh, and, you know, what does that look like? Well, there's a whole number of organisations out there, I think, that, that you know, have tools and mechanisms for, for um, helping you campaign to your super fund, to your banks, uh, take those steps, and if you don't get a good response, well, we're in a competitive marketplace, so move to someone else. And we're starting to see, um, in both of those sectors, in, in the banking sector and superannuation, funds that are emerging to try and respond to individuals that have a strong interest in um, you know, the, the environmental positions of their financial institutions. So, um, um, yeah, use the, use the kind of competitive forces uh, for, for, for good. And just for the benefit of the live stream, I don't think the question was picked up. It's what can we do as ordinary Australians um, to sort of accelerate this transition? Um, Jody and Brendan, did you want to add? Well, I'll, I'll embolden you with a couple of uh, a couple of facts. Last time I last time I looked, um, Australia had the second largest, I believe, pool of superannuation wealth in the world. So, even to a much greater extent than other countries, all of you are investors. Australians also have a, um, a much higher rate than most developed countries of people having uh, individually held investments because Australians just love to take a punt on things. Um, <laughs> but you're all, you're, you're all investors um, and the, you know, we don't, like, we, don't like to talk about, we don't like to talk about money. We're more willing to talk about sex than we are to talk about money. It seems very personal and very private. Um, but having open conversations about things like superannuation as something that should be managed, as something that you should make a decision about rather than just, you know, or, or banking. People, bank, people stick with the same bank for years and they never think about it. I just want to push on the app and do the thing that I need to do. You know, you're not a tree. You can move. Um, and being able to have that conversation with people across your network to sort of prime them for thinking about that themselves, talking about the choices that you've made to reduce that. Um, and there's also a country, there's a um, organization that's 
going to kind of ruin the example a little bit that I can't think of what the organization is called, but there's been you know, a lot of push for divestment, but that doesn't change the companies that are currently dirty. There's a, there's a uh, sort of contrary move, this organization that I'll have to look up later, um, and a, an advocacy organization, and their whole um, strategy is getting people to buy one share in each of those dirty companies might invest $500 or something, um, because then you get a vote. You get to go to an AGM, uh, you get to engage in shareholder action. So if you think about uh, you know, what Mike Cannon Brooks did with AGL, you're not gonna get as much press because you're not Mike Cannon Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> but all of, that is, all of that is possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, look, I think, the, I think the question and the answers are a great note of, of optimism because mm -hmm. Uh, what we're seeing now with these disclosure frameworks is the opportunity for greater transparency and the opportunity for better informed decisions about what's actually, which companies are inherently more sustainable uh, and where, which ones are at greater risk uh, in relation to climate and nature. So uh, better information has got to be better for empowerment and choice making, which is, you know, what my colleagues have been talking about here. So I think we're, you know, our current move to see a lot more of that driven mostly by business to some extent by um, by public sector involvement is a very positive thing so mm. Mm. other question I mean, great answers a great question other questions from the audience as well um, we've got a gentleman down the front here thank you um, can I first say congratulations Melbourne University for running these forums again and I look forward to attending a lot of them. <laughs> um, now, I have a farming background and I'm very aware that um, if we are going to feed the world, perhaps there are some benefits. Um, Syro did these trials up in the Mallee at Walpi up over nine years and got a 20, just under 21% increase in production. Um, now, I'm a Gippsland farmer and I can assure you that most of our intensive horticulture uh, farmers feed CO2 into their crops to get increased production. A comment? <laughs> mm. um, yeah, I'm and, happy to go. Yeah, I think Brendan and... Yeah, look, uh, the world is about... Um, thank you for your, uh, for your endorsement of these forums and, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you at, at, uh, at many more of them. Uh, you know, Life's about costs and benefits, and so there will be, uh, where you have enough moisture, where you have the right levels of humidity, some small increase in, uh, in productivity due to uh, increases in carbon dioxide. The cost is much larger areas of the planet that become desertified uh, and totally unworkable, coastal areas that become unstable and inundated, uh, and I probably don't need to go on, but there's, uh, there's the, the evidence around the cost to the economy uh, and including the agricultural economy are sort of of climate change, not to mention biodiversity loss, are quite irrefutable, I would say. So, so I think if that was the sort of direction of the question, I would say um, I, I'd say the benefit in on uh, for us is very thoughtful action about how we construct agriculture, um, how we do it, and how we invest in it, so that we get the very best outcomes, managing for the risks uh, of climate change. Mm. And I think maybe to build on that that question out a little bit further, it talked about the role of farmers. Mm brought to mind thinking about there are certain groups who are going to be affected more by these issues that we've been talking about. So um, agriculture, First Nations people. I was wondering if any of our panelists had comments on so this idea, these ideas of a just transition as well are really important. If any of you had a comment on that as well. I'm a sociologist by training, <laughs> so um, the, the, the equity piece um, is something I do think about a lot. Uh, and, you know, so when I, when I report for my fund, I always put uh, gender diversity metrics in there, and I had someone ask me, well, this isn't even relevant to what we do. I'm like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> if we create a green economy, 
that makes uh, gender inequities and racial inequities worse, that's, we, we've, we've tipped over that do no significant harm line. Mm. Um, so, you know, we have to use information to steer ourselves and not create, not reinscribe problems that already exist. Um, one of the things uh, that's starting to happen here in Australia, for instance, with uh, renewables, large scale, like utility scale renewables development, you know where there's a lot of empty space in Australia? It's not in suburban Melbourne. <laughs> it's often out in, uh, out in places that are held under native title. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, uh, my organization is doing a wind farm development in the Hay Plain, um, but it's doing it in collaboration with the traditional owners. Um, so that's, and that's, Anybody who's done developments in the past and expects it to work in exactly the same way, we just do this and these things happen, it's not going to be that way. But that is how we got to this problem in the first place, is by not considering the other users of the land. Um, so we're finding new ways of, of engaging respectfully and listening to what those stakeholders want out of it and ensuring that there is equity in where those benefits go. Mm. It's, it's actually worth, you know, it's worth reflecting that, uh, you know, the IPCC clearly state that, that people, Indigenous peoples tend to be disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change and, and indeed by the effects of ecosystem decline. However, the IPBS report notes that Indigenous held lands tend to be in the best condition have the best uh, biodiversity values uh, and present, I think, the best opportunities uh, in this country for projects that are positive for carbon, including managing country, um, you know, savanna burning regimes that can bring really strong benefits to First Nations and obviously have the, the, uh, the accus and bring benefits to nature and to biodiversity. So, you know, I guess drawing on the strength that we have in that those millennia of uh, very strong cultural understanding of land management practices to get good outcomes for emissions and good outcomes for nature uh, and improve uh, reconciliation and, and equitable sharing of benefits, I think is a really positive uh, place that we're at. Mm -hmm. um, look, I'm conscious of the time. We've only got a few minutes left of tonight. So I might just ask each of our panellists um, in turn to Give our audience, if you could give everybody one take home message from tonight, um, what would that be? I might start with you, Arj. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so I think, I think that the, the main thing um, that I hope people will take away from this is that, um, that you know, there's, um, despite, <laughs> despite the kind of, um, uh, size of the problems that we've been talking about, that there are um, really kind of important changes happening in the background of, um, you know, we've been talking about financial institutions a lot, but they're, they're sort of, there's, there's big change happening, I think, in the background. Um, and so there's a real opportunity now um, uh, to be engaged in this discussion um, because there's there's you know pressure coming from the top and we also need pressure coming from below and so I think um, you know now is the moment to kind of engage the financial institutions that you're a part of um, and and you know let them know really clearly unequivocally that there is demand and support for the work that they're doing um, I, th I think that's a bit of an abstract idea but I think it's actually quite important to ensure that, um, that momentum continues to build because a lot of this work is really complicated and um, um, people sitting within financial institutions um, uh, really need that type of support to keep, keep this conversation and the processes moving along. Yeah. Jodie, a couple of sentences. I'd echo that and, um, and say that, you know, the people in those financial institutions are people. They've got, they've got families, they, you know, they live in neighborhoods. Like what they do at work is not the only thing that they do. And everything is a sustainability issue. Um, so have those sustainability conversations. And sometimes you know, act, asking is a really powerful act because if nobody ever asks, 
institutions, businesses presume that there's no demand for that information, it's not interesting to know. If people are asking about it, they will find ways to look into it and generate the information. Just you know, keep engaging on this is important. Perfect. And Brendan. Yeah, look, a lot of sustainability uh, investment, I think, is going to go into energy transformation over the next 10 years. We absolutely have to transition. Uh, we've got to get to net zero. That's a given. However, we have to think holistically. The danger of a single-minded focus on investment in technological transformation towards energy transition will cause harm in agriculture, in First Nations culture, in biodiversity. So let's try and make sure that our investments are you know, positive on all of those key fronts of, e of ESG, not just uh, on around the, the, the climate transition. So try and you know, make sure that we're thinking holistically about this problem. Wonderful. So please welcome, um, join me in thanking all of our wonderful panellists tonight. <laughs>